Well, good afternoon. It's, it's great to be here in uh, St. Petersburg again. Uh, we got a number of, uh, of folks that have joined us. I have uh, Senator Galvano and Representative DeSigley uh, from here in Pinellas County. Uh, thanks, Nick, and, and thanks, Bill, for what you've done. I got John Vasquez, Suncoast Police Benevolent Association. And we got a lot of folks um, associated with the hotel and lodging uh, and restaurant industry. Uh, Danette Lynch, uh, Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association. Mary Beth Hansen, owner of Paradise Grill. JT Corrales, Operations Director for Krabby Bills. Eric Potts, General Manager, Bella's Italian. Heather Dawkins, Senior Manager of the Canopy at Birchwood. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I have an announcement today, but before I do that, I uh, just want to make some, some comments. We had a, um, a big unveiling of some proposed legislation on Monday um, in terms of uh, maintaining law and order, public safety, and supporting the men and women who wear the uniform. And um, part of the reason we did that is some of the activity we see throughout the country. Uh, what we saw uh, here in St. Petersburg the other night uh, with uh, mobs harassing innocent people who were just enjoying a meal at a restaurant is simply unacceptable. Uh, if you go out uh, here in the state of Florida and you're sitting in a restaurant, you should be able to do that in peace uh, without having some lunatic come up and yell in your face. Um, I think that that should be dealt with anyways, uh, but our legislation will certainly do that. Uh, it's simply unacceptable to allow that type of behavior uh, here in the state of Florida. And so for those uh, law-abiding men and women who just want to live their lives, uh, we got your back. Uh, more help is on the way. Today's uh, announcement is uh, something that we, we discussed a little bit yesterday. We had a, uh, a Zoom roundtable with some uh, real esteemed scientists uh, from Stanford Medical School and Harvard Medical School uh, discussing a whole range of issues about the, about the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but also specifically uh, some of the mitigation measures in terms of, of businesses uh, that have been done. In the state of Florida, you know, people, we probably are the, the, the most open big state in the country. I mean, if you look, we've had theme parks operating for many months. Uh, of course, the beaches, hotels, restaurants. We had some places in, in the panhandle that had record summers. Uh, other places did well. Some other places were a little slower, partially through local, because of local restrictions. Some of them just from the natural lag in tourism uh, that we've seen. Uh, but, but I think we've been able uh, to put a lot of people back to work over the last few months uh, and then obviously uh, have more to do. So uh, today um, we have a lot of folks from the restaurant industry. They've been working very hard, have had uh, uh, operating under 50% uh, capacity indoors. They have been doing a lot outdoors, but in Florida over the summer, that's not always the easiest. Uh, that will get a little bit better going forward as the weather cools. Uh, but um, in the state of Florida, uh, we are uh, today moving into uh, uh, what we initially called phase three. Uh, and what that will mean for the restaurants is that there will not be limitations uh, from this, the state of Florida. And in fact, uh, we're also cognizant about the need for business certainty. Uh, there have been some local closures and, um, and other types of restrictions. And so uh, the order that I'm signing today uh, will guarantee restaurants uh, operate, uh, will not allow closures. Uh, they can operate uh, at a minimum of 50% regardless of local rule. And then if a local restricts between 50 and 100, they've got to provide the justification and they've got to identify what the costs are involved with doing that are. Uh, and I think that that's important. This is a very difficult uh, industry to succeed in. Uh, the margins aren't great. And if you go back to March, we were told 15 days to slow the spread. So that was, in, in Florida, we followed, we followed that. It was no dining restaurants, the, the bars, the gyms, uh, no elective procedures, some of these things. And then they said, well, you know what, we need another 30 days. So 30 days to slow the spread. So we did that as well. And yet you have some people say, well, you can never do uh, you know, full what you want to do until there's a vaccine. Well, we don't know, hopefully. But now people are saying, hey, even if there's a vaccine, it's still going to take another year before you can operate appropriately. And uh, you know, I don't think that's viable. I don't think that that is, is acceptable. Um, and so I think that this will be, be very, very important to the industry. And it also will be a recognition that they have worked as hard as anybody to create safe environments. In fact, the idea that government dictating this 
is better than them making these decisions so that their customers have confidence, um, I think is misplaced. And I've gone to many restaurants over the last uh, many months, and, uh, and they take this obligation seriously. They want customers to have confidence, and so they have every incentive uh, to want to do that uh, going forward. We're also saying in the state of Florida, everybody has an opportunity and the right to work. Every business has an op uh, the, the right to operate. You know, some of the locals may be able to, you know, they can do reasonable regulations, but you can't just say no. You can't say no after six months uh, and just have people twisting in the wind. Um, and so I think that that's another important uh, principle. If you looked at what we did yesterday and listened to some of those experts, uh, it, it's pretty clear that uh, we use our resources best when we focus them on the people that are most vulnerable to COVID-19. Um, and, and I think that that's readily apparent uh, that that's the elderly population. CDC recently re revised and put out a new best estimate for the fatality rate for infections. An estimation, not cases, because there are way more infections than documented cases. And here's what they, here's what they have. So if you look under 20, the survival rate, if you're infected with COVID-19, according to CDC, is 99.997%. If you're between 20 and 49, the survival rate is 99.98%. So under 50, that is less than seasonal influenza in terms of, in terms of the severity. Now, when you get to 50 or 69, 99.5%, you know, that's more severe than seasonal influenza. It's probably, uh, you know, real severe, probably akin to a real severe uh, flu. And then, of course, 70 plus, 94.6% survival rate. Uh, you know, that is really, really significant. And that is where most of uh, the hospitalizations uh, and the mortality uh, have come. And so those experts agreed, and we've always tried to do this in Florida, and we're going to continue. But, you know, our focus is really going to be uh, on those folks uh, who are most at risk. Uh, part of that is what we're doing with long-term care and nursing homes. But really, it goes beyond that into the broader senior community. We're going to be able to do more things uh, with some of the new testing that's come out. Um, but then, of course, also you know, knowing your risk and being able to govern yourself accordingly, which many, many folks in that age group have done a really good job of in Florida over the last many months. So, so that's what we're, what we're looking at. So rather than trying to close um, things, what you want to do is have an age-specific strategy that really focuses on mitigating exposures and mitigating infections from the people that are the most at risk uh, for this. And so if you take a step back and look at where Florida is in terms of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, we, from July, at the beginning of July was the peak of infections. The ED visits peaked um, between July 7th and July 14th. Uh, kind of a plateau and then it's kind of gone down ever since the hospitalizations peaked on July 21st. So, so th that's over two months ago. And what have we seen since the third week of July? We've actually seen more economic activity, more interaction, schools have opened, all the theme parks are open, more people have visited, and what has happened with hospitalizations? COVID positive hospitalizations are down 76% since the July peak. ICU hospitalizations are down 72% since the July peak. Daily admissions for people getting admitted for either uh, confirmed or suspected COVID has declined by 81% uh, since that mid-July peak. And the ED visits for COVID-like illness are down close to 80% as well. Here in Pinellas County, uh, I think in many ways, Pinellas saw the increase hit before some of the other parts of the state. Uh, and they've definitely seen the decline go down quicker than many other parts of the state. The number of tests, the percentage of tests that come back positive in Pinellas County has been below 4% for two weeks. And if you know anything about these PCR tests, um, at least 1% are probably just false positives. Some of the other ones, if the people aren't symptomatic, may be picking up dead virus. That's a very low number uh, for, for Pinellas County. Hospitalizations in Pinellas County have decreased by 79% uh, since the July peak, and daily admissions to the hospital in Pinellas have declined by 82% since the peak. Individuals showing up for the ER to the ED with COVID-like symptoms 
has decreased by more than 80 percent uh, since the first week of July. And so uh, I think what we've seen is um, we've been able to put more people back to work. Uh, all these indicators have gone down since July. You know, the end of, end of June and July, um, you, know, you know, were tough not only for Florida but through across the Sun Belt. Uh, but you've seen steady, steady progress uh, going in this direction. And so uh, we need everyone to be able to go to work. Uh, we need people to be able to be in school. We have over 1.1 million students who are in person having instruction. We've had schools open since at least August 11th in parts of the state and, and certainly uh, at least a month almost every place in the state except southern Florida, although Palm Beach County is open for in person and, and, and Broward and Miami-Dade are going to start soon. Uh, so that's very, very important. Our universities have people that are in, in person, the students, uh, that's important to do. Uh, we have uh, college sports, we have high school sports, of course the NFL um, with fans in most parts of the state, uh, which, I think is, which I think is great. So I, I'm, I'm glad to be able to uh, stand with some folks here who've been working very hard under very difficult circumstances. Uh, I think that I'm going to have a couple of them come up and want to say some stuff, but I think this will be um, you know, really, really significant for them um, in, terms of, in, in terms of the way forward here. So. Um, is anyone who wants to come up and talk about anyone from the restaurant? Go ahead. Yep. Well, first of all, I'd like to commend Governor DeSantis for his leadership throughout this pandemic. Uh, I've said multiple times to friends and family how truly grateful I am that he's the steward of our state. Um, today is a big step for us as restaurateurs in the road to recovery. Uh, we employ almost 500 people pre-pandemic, uh, so it's, it's been a long road, but we're working hard to get back on. And I think that this gives us a real fighting chance. So I'm very grateful for you and just grateful that we had the opportunity to be here and see this through. Can you tell about your, your plate, your restaurant, where you're at located? Yeah, so we're, uh, we're a 38-year-old business located down on Indian Rocks Beach. Uh, we have multiple other locations along the, the coastline and a few inland. Uh, so we, are, uh, we were very exposed at the beginning of this pandemic, and uh, we're fortunate to be where we are today and, and you know we still got a long way to go but this is a this is a, a very very big step in the right direction. It's crabby bills. Yes. <laughs> crabby bills in Rock speech. <laughs> What's your name? I'm sorry, tell us your name. Uh, my name is JT Corrales. I'm uh, the director of business development. Well Governor, echoing uh, JT there, I want to thank on behalf of the industry, number one, you recognizing how hard they work to stay in business. There's probably never been a more challenging time for our restaurants and our hotels, not only the owners, uh, the, all the workers, and you've just created a lot more jobs today, too, that I think certainly needs to be recognized. But the opportunity for us as patrons, um, we hope and encourage that we'll have people going out even more now. And uh, we thank you very much for all that you've done for uh, both the restaurants and the lodging. Thank you, Governor. And Governor, thank you for your great leadership, first in terms of protecting and supporting law and order and law enforcement. And I really appreciate the measured approach that you've taken with the economy and, and the a business community as we've navigated this pandemic and I appreciate the business leaders standing here with us. What I'd like to share with you all today is because of these decisions and the measured approach uh, starting at the plaza level, the governor's office and, and then through the legislature, uh, we saw our revenue collections for the state of Florida, our August collections, and they were $177 million over post-pandemic estimate. So we are already on the path to recovery, and what the governor is doing here today is just going to continue that, that path and, and perhaps accelerate it. So uh, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you, and again, thank you, sir. Good afternoon. My name is John Vasquez, president of Sun Coast Police Benevolent Association. I just want to make it clear that Sun Coast Police, Police Benevolent Association and its members, the men and women in uniform, wholeheartedly support the right for peaceful protest. That's what we're here to protect the Constitution for those men and women. We appreciate and we need laws passed to help protect the men and women in uniform, to help protect those civilians who choose to peacefully protest. Thank you, Governor, for everything that you've done for us. Okay. 
Another thing that uh, we're going to be doing going forward in addition to uh, really focusing on protecting uh, elderly and uh, as more uh, means become available to do that is uh, focusing on some of the other health impacts uh, of the pandemic. And, and they are legion. I, I think we had a good discussion of it yesterday with some of the experts. Uh, we know that there was a huge decline in ED visits for heart and stroke and, and some very common ailments. Uh, we suspect that that's already probably led uh, to some excess mortality. Unfortunately, these are folks who uh, were fearful of going to the hospital, um, you know, maybe thought that the hospitals didn't have capacity, which was never true. But, um, but I think that there was, there was narratives put out about that. Uh, and so, and I've spoken with physicians around the state where they have people in ICU for heart who if they had gone in earlier would never have reached that stage. So we want to be discussing that. We also want to be discussing the importance of getting things like cancer screenings. The cancer uh, miss screenings is not going to show up today, next month, may not even show up next year, but you can bet it's going to start showing up uh, if this continues uh, several years into the future. So very, very important. Also immunizations for, for children. When the pandemic hit and, and the fear factor reached the, its zenith in March, you started to see a big decline in parents who were taking uh, their children to be vaccinated. And uh, we see this uh, um, COVID chart. Uh, COVID is less uh, dangerous for uh, young kids than seasonal influenza and certainly much dangerous than other diseases that they have good vaccinations for. So we definitely, definitely want to get the message out for folks to start doing that. Also, mental health. There is a, uh, a CDC study that was cited by, I think, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya from Stanford yesterday where I think it was between 18 and 24, uh, 25 percent of our folks between 18 and 24 reported having uh, depression or some signs of, of mental, mental health problems. That is a huge, huge issue that needs to be combated. We've worked also already and we're going to do more. There was a lot of progress that had been made on some of the, the drug abuse like opioids. I think that's probably progress that was erased starting in, in March. And so we're probably back uh, to where we were and, and need to start working forward. But I do think that the more society is, is functioning, the more uh, people that have jobs, the more businesses that can succeed, the more opportunities for parents to send their kids to school, I think a lot of those other things become easier uh, to deal with. But let's not make any mistake about it, uh, focusing on only one pathogen without all these other things is not an effective public health strategy. With that, take some questions. Governor, how does this uh, transition in phases affect other industries outside of hospitality and restaurants? It really doesn't very much because we've had everything open. Um, there may be some local restrictions in some parts of southern Florida about doing some of the, um, uh, like a banquet hall or something. And again, my, our, what the order is going to say, they have a right to operate. You can insist on certain regulations, and obviously I think you're probably going to see a different approach in southern Florida than you will in the panhandle on some of that, and I think that that's fine. But I think everything is, has been open uh, before this order. Uh, this just allows uh, the restaurants to really be able to, to do this, I think, in a way that makes you know, I, I was in Dunedin with, uh, with, with, with a guy that owns this, this small restaurant. It's more of an upscale deal. You walk in, it's just a room with, with seats, and it's like, he doesn't get enough traffic to really do half, but you could fill it, and it's not like it's really crowded. I mean, it's fine. And so some of these things, I think, were a little too mechanical. They have every incentive to provide a good environment for their customers, and there's going to be some customers that maybe they say they only want to do outdoor. They're going to have to provide a safe outdoor. Maybe they'll do indoor as long as, as, long as they have uh, precautions that they think. And, and I think that's the best way to do it. But it's not really a one-size-fits-all because I went to some restaurants where they're following the rules, but quite frankly, it didn't make sense. They could have done more without really causing any type of um, major difference in, ter in terms of any type of uh, a transmission. Governor, how are large uh, venues like uh, Bucks games, Rays games, how are they impacted by uh, phase three? Well, they're not really impacted because I've supported that. Um, and it's not a question of really government. It's really what the leagues have been comfortable with. I very much support the Bucks having fans. I think what the Dolphins did to start off, I think, was really great. The Jags, um, you know, it's interesting. You know, the Jags, uh, they're allowing fans. They couldn't even sell out limited capacity. 
um, partially because I think some of the some of the fans are concerned with with some of the things that, that we've been seeing come out of the league. But um, so they can operate now. I fully understand, and we will work with them. They they want to go slower more than anyone. So it's not like they want to have full capacity. But I think you can do much more than what's been done. Outdoor transmission has just not been a major factor. Doesn't mean it can't happen. Doesn't mean there aren't things that you can think about in some of these venues. But I'd like to see everyone have uh, fans at some capacity, and then let's build going forward. One of the reasons I really wanted to have the buck, well, two reasons. One, Tom's the quarterback. You know, everyone wants to watch Tom Brady and Gronk and all these great players. And I'll tell you what, it was, it, it, and I'm, I don't know how much football I'm going to watch this year, but I definitely watch on Sunday. I mean, I just, you know, I'm going to keep watching them. Um, and so I think people wanted to be there, which is good. But I also want to be able to show we're going to be able to host the Super Bowl in February. We expect to do a full Super Bowl, and we're going to show that we're going to be able to do that. I think they can still do that, uh, and I know there's some issues about insurance and all these other things, and I, and I respect that, and maybe um, we'll address that after the election uh, here in Florida uh, with the new legislature. But, um, but yeah, I think it's important. I also think you know, we have musicians. They should be able to play, and they should be able to do, do some of this stuff, particularly on these outdoor venues. You can do it, you can do it safely. Again, right to work, that's, that's uniform now in Florida. Um, and so some of these people, you know, we want to get, make sure they have an opportunity. I know some have been doing it, uh, but I've had some folks ask me about you know, certain you know, restrictions. We didn't really have restrictions, but I think people were just, were just concerned. Um, I think you can get to yes on all this stuff. And there's certainly no, no legal prohibition for them doing fans. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, do you have any concerns that so here's what I think. Um, we've had way more activity over the last two months than we did over the prior two. We've seen big declines. Um, at the same time, this is a virus that has confounded a lot of people. We're prepared if we see an increase. We're not closing anything going forward. But I think if you look at our hospital capacity, if you look at what we did to marshal the, the latest medications, uh, if you look at we, what we've done to help with all the PPE and the testing and everything, uh, you know, we have the tools in place uh, that we need. Is there going to be a true, a true second wave? Understand, the Northeast wave was March and April. That was not our wave. Our uh, Sun Belt all uh, went in the, in the June, July. And if you look at the, the epidemic curves from Los Angeles, uh, Arizona, Texas, Florida, Georgia, it's almost the same basic curve. Arizona is a little bit higher than us in terms of per capita mortality. Georgia, Florida, Texas, pretty, pretty close. There were all different reopenings, different policies. And so, um, you know, and then Los Angeles, obviously, they were one of the most restrictive of any place, and they basically had the similar thing that we had to deal with. So I think we're ready to deal with it. But the question is, is has there been a second wave anywhere? I think we should prepare for that, but there has not yet been. What you see in Europe is a lot of cases, uh, very few hospitalizations, but in the areas that you're seeing it, those are areas that weren't, weren't uh, really affected the first time. Um, so, so we'll be ready for it. I think people should still understand that the virus, it doesn't go away. I mean, even if you have a vaccine, it doesn't go away because the chance of the vaccine being 100% effective is very small. So, so it's going to be at a minimum endemic. Uh, and so that's why I think it's so important, you know, to focus on the risk to the folks um, who, who are who are especially vulnerable for this. Uh, that's going to continue to be an issue. We're going to continue to be supporting uh, our long-term care and nursing homes. And then also some of the things. So yesterday I was with the president, and any time you get near them, they make you do a test. And, and I say, I'm not symptomatic. I don't need to do it, but they make you do it. Well, there's a new Abbott test that's like a card. You could actually, like, put it in your pocket, open it up, they do some swab, and it's an antigen test, 15 minutes. They're producing millions and millions and millions of those a week. So that gives us an opportunity to say, okay, uh, it's been the case where if you have a, like a 20-year-old grand, uh, grandkid, you may not have wanted them if you're 80 years old, uh, although many of the seniors do. I mean, it's, it's interesting. When, when we did the visitation for the, for the nursing homes, everyone was so happy because it's like, you know, some of these folks were telling us, I want to live to see my family. And when the family, some of the family members came with the PP and the mask, so, some of the residents said, take off your mask, I want to see you smile. 
So sometimes we think we know what folks want and that, that they're all so fearful of this. I think people have taken proper precautions, but I think a lot of people really want to be able to, we want to, be able to live. So, but we have the ability, though, if you want, you, know, you could potentially have these 15-minute these tests for uh, you know, younger people who are going to visit older relatives and, and really try to use the resources to make sure that the folks who are older can do as much uh, as possible you know, with protections. And so I think we're in a much better position uh, now than we were in March and April, but I think we're even in a better position June. I mean, we built up what we needed to do. We never had hospital capacity uh, overrun or anything like that. We were prepared. Right now, if you look at our hospital capacity, I think we have 24% of all beds are empty and 23% of ICU beds are empty. That's actually not a good thing for hospitals. They want to run these at higher capacity than that. That's much more empty beds than before the pandemic began. Part of that, I think, is just the, the, the lagging um, willingness of people to go in and, and to seek, seek the treatment they need. So we do want people to go in and do that. But I, I asked those experts. So we had uh, Martin Calder from Harvard Medical School, Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford, uh, Mike Levitt from uh, Stanford, who's a Nobel Prize winner. And I said, do you have any concern about hospital overrun? Having watched this virus, in different continents, different countries, and different U.S. states, do you think it will overwhelm the medical system? They all said no, no, and no. And remember, when we did the 15 days to slow the spread, the whole reason was to buy time so that the hospitals weren't overwhelmed, which obviously would be bad for corona patients, but also all the other patients. And so I think the U.S. as a whole has clearly succeeded in doing that, I think our hospital system is completely capable of handling it. In fact, if anything, you know, the hospital needs more patients and some of these other reasons uh, and some of the other health reasons to be able to go. So, uh, but I would just tell people, you know, the fact that you continue to move forward with the economy, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, the virus disappears. And so people should just understand it's something that we're going to have to deal with. But all, just as all those experts said yesterday when we had our thing, Doing that from a fetal position where society flounders, people are out of work, kids aren't in school, that is not going to work and that's not the way forward for us. Is this effective immediately? My, so I don't, um, I don't address it directly. Actually, it's a good point. Um, so what I did do in there is, um, just as an act of executive grace, all outstanding uh, fines and penalties uh, that have been applied against individuals are suspended. Uh, I think we need to get away from trying to penalize people for social distancing and, and just work with people constructively, you know, put out the, the, what you want, um, but to, to, to impose some type of penalty of either, some actually have jail sentences attached. I don't know if that's actually been done, but I looked at some of those. Um, you know, but, but all, these, all these fines we're gonna hold in abeyance and uh, hope that we can move forward in a way that's more collaborative. So is reopening right now? Is it start the moment that we leave here? So, yeah, it's uh, effective immediately. And to be clear, it's full phase three. Phase three, full, full phase yeah. Three. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing that's a little bit different from what they had was, you know, because there've been some uh, issues with these bars, what we said to the locals on that is, okay, the bars are status quo from what we have. If you want to go beyond the 50, you can authorize it and do it. We're not telling you you have to, but we're not going to stand in the way of that. So that'll be a local decision if they want to try to do more capacity um, in some of the bars and pubs. And, uh, and I'd imagine that you will see a difference of opinion on how that shakes out in different parts of the state, which is fine. And I think that working, uh, working together on that makes a lot of sense. The video you saw from downstairs, obviously that upset you. How do you envision law enforcement responding to those types of situations? So what I think is, and as, and as was said, you go out and protest until your heart's content. It's your right to stand for what you want. Uh, no one is going to begrudge that, even though, I mean, quite frankly, some of the stuff that's said in these protests about the people in uniform I find revolting. I don't agree with it. But nevertheless, that's, the, that's, that, that's, uh, that's what the country's all about, to be able to go up there and do that. The minute that crosses over from just peaceful assembly to where you're harassing somebody else or you're intimidating or threatening them, particularly when they're in a public accommodation like a restaurant um, or if they're in their residence. I mean, some of these places in, like, 
Oregon, you're starting to see some of these groups go into to neighborhoods. That is unacceptable. We're not going to allow it. And, um, and I think uh, when we did our press conference on Monday, Sheriff Judd and uh, Polk County, pretty, pretty plain spoken, he said, sign of a peaceful protest. This is what this is. We all know it. This is not. This is when you cross the line. And I think crossing the line is really when you start harassing uh, or intimidating just private citizens who are trying to go about their business. I looked at those folks. All they're doing is sitting down, having a meal. You know, who knows what, what, what's on their mind? Who knows what issues they're having to deal with in their life? And then to have a bunch of people do that, um, I think it's just unacceptable. That's not the way of life here in Florida. Uh, I don't think that that's conducive uh, to having a, a safe society. Um, and we just can't allow, allow that to happen. So I was, I was disappointed in, in seeing it. We actually, I mean, I had, once we saw that, you know, we had state resources, we were ready to marshal, and we didn't need to, uh, to do that, fortunately. But man, it's, um, it's not a good look uh, for the state. It was not fair to those people who were sitting there just eating. And you really want to live in a society where any time you venture into public, you can have somebody just come um, and do that to you? Uh, I, I don't want that. I don't think that that's right. Governor, did you see the photograph of them giving the protesters the middle finger? I did not. Last question. Oh, Governor, I have a question. Um, and it states, it says, Rick Wilson is dealing with the election. Rick Wilson is a legal project. is claiming that Governor DeSantis you, has a plan to call the legislation into session after the election and change the winner of Florida if it appears close for Biden and appears to win. Is that true? In Who is that? Uh, I guess Rick Wilson of the Lincoln Project. Yeah. I think that you might... I, I don't know who that is, and um, uh, I, uh, I think that that's just um, people putting out a, a scuttlebutt or, you know, probably someone trying to grift off something. So, okay, well, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.